this, this is joint work with uh, Shane Maxfield and uh, Lloyd Provost. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to talk about quantifying contextuality. And, uh, so, so there's been so now there've been around uh, a number of frameworks for non-cardiac contextuality in general measurement scenarios, and in particular the one by introduced by Samson and uh, Adam Brandenburger, which is the one we'll uh, be using in this talk. And uh, so the idea of these frameworks is that they work for general measurement scenarios and they unify the usual discussions of non-locality and of contextuality and under the same setting. Um, in particular, in the, in the abramsky Brandenburger framework, uh, a qualitative hierarchy of contextuality for empirical models has been suggested. Um, in particular, so, so um, Kohei has talked about it in, in his um, uh, tutorial two days ago. It's strong contextuality and logical contextuality, <coughs> probabilistic contextuality. But uh, so the idea of this talk is to have a sort of a quantitative grading to this and, and introduce some sort of measure of contextuality. And the reason why we'd be interested in that is that we'd like to compare the degree of contextuality of several different models and across different scenarios, not just for one scenario. And um, also, it might be important if one has in mind using contextuality as a resource because we're going to quantify uh, this resource and also the point is that there might there, there may be more than one useful uh, measure uh, that, that, that can be useful to, there might be different measures of contextuality so in this talk we're going to focus in particular on the contextual fraction which is uh, an idea that generalizes the, the non-local fraction which is Contextual fraction satisfies a number of desirable properties. So, first, it's quite general. Um, so, it's, it's generally applicable to, to any measurement scenario, right? So, you can, you can apply it to, 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 to any sort of measurement scenario. So, you all from non locality to contextuality in different kind of uh, empirical scenarios we're considering. Uh, it's normalized. So you'll always have a value between 0 and 1, and this allows you to compare it across different uh, scenarios for the amount of contextuality. So in particular, it'll be 0 whenever we don't have any contextuality, and it'll be 1. 1 will correspond to the notion of strong contextuality that Kohei uh, has introduced, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention it a little further on as well. Um, also, it's computable, in action, so we, we can use linear programming to compute this uh, um, contextual fraction. And, uh, quite importantly, it has a, a very precise relationship with violations of general bell inequalities. Uh, this is what we'll uh, talk about in, in this talk. So, so, contextuality. So, the kind of uh, scenarios we, we're looking at, or the kind of uh, empirical situation we're looking at, is, is um, I mean, it's the sort of thing that, that Kohei has talked in his, in, in his talk already. So, so, the idea is that we have some sort of Empirical procedure. We have a number of measures that we can make together, and um, for such measures, measurements that you can make together, you can have probabilities of the joint outcomes of these measurements. So, in particular, this is the usual Bell scenario. So, we have Alice and Bob. Alice can choose between uh, making measure measurements A1 or A2. Bob can choose between B1 and B2, and they'll have outcome zero or one. So, they have two dichotomic measurements each, and then sort of what we call our measurement context are these rows of the table, so A1, B1 represents the, the, the situation in which Alice chooses to measure A1 and Bob chooses to measure B1, and this is the measurement context, and, and for these one will have a, a probability on, on the possible joint outcomes, and similarly for all the other measurement contexts. But it's, I mean, this is just the usual Bell scenario, but, but a similar, uh, but, so this approach deals with a, with a, a much larger class of scenarios, I mean, particularly including contextuality scenarios. And so the general uh, framework uh, is the following. So we have a measurement scenario will be a triple where we have a finite set of measurements or variables, whatever you call them. O would be a finite set of outcomes or the values uh, for these variables. So in, in, in the, here it was 0 and 1. Um, and then we have a cover of X which indicates which uh, measurements can be uh, made together. So, and this is what we call the context. So, 
going back to the, the example we had before, the set of variables and the set of measurements was A1, A2, B1, and B2. The outcomes were 0 and 1, and the measurement context was where B4, where there's one choice for others and one choice for both. Um, then a joint outcome or an event, uh, we usually denote it by S. So given the context C, this will be just an assignment of outcomes to uh, each uh, element of, of C. So for example, this is an event for the context A1, B1, in which Alice measures 1, Bob measures B1. Alice measures A1, Bob measures B1, and it gets outcome 0 and 1 recently. And these, are, these, these events correspond to the, to, the, to the cells of this table here. Right. Uh, so another example, very quickly, is so for example the 18 vector quotient spec, where we have 18 variables, again two outcomes, and then measurement cover is given by these nine different contexts. Okay, so now what are empirical models? So given a measurement scenario, so the measurement scenario just describes sort of the, the shape of the uh, situation that we're, we're dealing with, and the empirical model is the actual probability table, so it's basically all these probabilities that we have in that table. So an empirical model will be a family of probability distributions, uh, one for each context, and there's a probability distribution on the joint uh, assignments of values to the measurements um, uh, in that context. Okay. So, so these are the rows of the probability tables we were talking about. And we'll impose this compatibility condition, which is that uh, the distributions agree on overlaps. So whenever we have two different contexts, C and C prime, the marginal of the distributions to the intersection of the context C and C prime will be the same. And in particular, this might be familiar for, from, from non-locality as the, as the no signal principle. So if you, if you think, so if you consider a, a Bell scenario like the one we were talking about before, this reduces to, um, to the usual no signal principle. Right, because it, so if you have Alice has A1, and Bob could choose B1 or B2. So if one context is A1, B1, and the other one is A1, B2, uh, then the fact that uh, the probabilities for Alice when you, when you forget about Bob are the same means that cannot be any signal. Bob cannot signal by, by his choice of measurements. Uh, can't send information to Alice. Um, okay, so what's contextuality then? The contextuality, so a model will be, an empirical model will be non-contextual if there exists a global distribution, so a distribution on the, out, on the joint outcomes of all the measurements at the same time, which marginalizes and marginalizes all the empirical distributions that we have in the model. So it, it can recover the model from it. And uh, so this is this is this this definition sort of uh, is kind of close to to the one of, uh, of, of to the contextual definition of, of, of Cauchy and Specker. It, it looks slightly different from the usual definition of non-locality, but they're, they're all the same by Fine's theorem. So um, basically, what it means is that so non-contextuality means that we can glue all the local information into a consistent global description, and so contextuality will be will be uh, arising whenever we have some sort of some data that is locally consistent, so this corresponds to no signaling, but it's not glo but it's globally consistent, so it's not globally consistent. Right? Um, and so what, what the theorems of Bell and of Bell Cauchy Specker say is that there are actual quantum mechanical empirical models, things that we can observe uh, uh, in real life that do exhibit this contextual behavior. Uh, okay, so just one little slide to explain this uh, strong contextuality, which uh, Kohei has done a good job of explaining um, two days ago. But the idea of uh, strong contextuality, so it's a very strong form of contextuality that works at the levels of possibilities. So you forget about the, the, the actual probabilities, just look at the possibilities. And uh, the idea is that there is not a single global assignment of uh, outcomes to all the measurements at the same time that's consistent with the model. So there's no, there's, there's no global assignments um, uh, that assign, so assign outcomes to, to all, the, all the measurements at the same time, <coughs> such that when you restrict it to each context, you have an event that has some non-zero probability of that. Uh, so this so is strong contextuality. Now, uh, for the actual fraction, so... So just 
recalling that non-contextuality is the idea that there's this global probability distribution that sort of recovers all of all of the uh, empirical probabilities, so it's marginal to each context of empirical probabilities. Um, but then, if if this fails, you can ask: so, which fraction of the model would admit a non-contextual explanation? So, if, if, the, if the model as a whole doesn't admit such a non-contextual explanation, can, can we still say a certain fraction of the model does? And so. You can sort of relax this requirement by considering probability subdistributions. And you just consider a subdistribution on the global assignments such that when you marginalize, this will be smaller or equal than each of, each of the, uh, the empirical probability distributions. That you get. So a subdistribution is just as a probability distribution, but where, where uh, all the uh, probabilities are, don't need to add up to one, so it, it can add up to less than uh, so the non-contextual fraction would be the maximum weight that we could give to such a sub-distribution consistent with the model. Equivalently, another way of formulating this is to say that it is the maximum weight over all convex decompositions of the model. As, so if you write the model as a convex decomposition of a non-contextual model and some other model, which should be contextual, um, then um, the maximum weight you could give to this lambda is a non-contextual fraction. And in fact, whenever you have, whenever lambda is, is, is maximal, this other model will indeed be strongly contextual. So you can see that this lambda sort of goes from 0 to 1 between non-contextuality and strong contextuality. Uh, okay, so we write NCF for the non-contextual fraction and CF for the contextual fraction. Okay, so now how do we compute these using linear programming? So first, let's just see how, how we can phrase contextuality as, as, a, as a system of linear equations. So given a measurement scenario of the kind we've been considering, we'll define this incidence matrix. And the incidence matrix uh, will have m rows will be indexed by uh, the local the events, so the, the local section of the events. So these are sort of the cells of our probability table. So it's, uh, context and uh, a joint outcome for the measurement of that context. Um, on the other hand, the, uh, the columns of this matrix will be indexed by the global assignments. Okay, and then very simply what you have is that there will be a 1 at this entry of the matrix if and only if this global assignment, when restricted to the context, gives back this uh, local assignment, S. And otherwise there's a 0. And, uh, so you can think of uh, an empirical model, so if you, if you take one of these tables we had before, you can just flatten it out and think of it as a vector in Rn. So it's got, a, it's got some sort of, uh, some real numbers and probability for each uh, local, um, uh, for each of these local events, or for each of these assignments of things to one particular context. So that's the probability of the table, flattened out as a vector. On the other hand, the columns of the matrix correspond to the deterministic non-contextual models. So the columns of this matrix, so each column is indexed by a global assignment, and what's written in there is the empirical model that corresponds to this global assignment. So it will be sort of corresponding to one of the tables where there's only one one in each context, and, it's, and the whole thing is deterministic. And every non-contextual model is a mixture of these deterministic non and uh, then you can see the probability distribution on global assignments of x is just given by a vector in Rn, so a vector that has one, one, one coordinate for each of these global assignments. And then the corresponding non-contextual model, the non-contextual model corresponds to it, is just given by multiplying the matrix with this vector. And you get this um, corresponding non-contextual model. So one can phrase non-contextuality very, simple, very simply in this term by saying that the model E is non-contextual if and only if there's such a uh, vector d, so it's such a probability distribution on global assignments, such that md is equal to the, the, the empirical models, such that we recover this empirical model from from the uh, from the uh, from the, uh, the global the distribution on global assignments, right? And so the, the restriction is that d must be larger equal to zero, which means that it actually have to be probabilities. And, I mean, they should be or equal to one as well, but that comes immediately from, from these uh, uh, equations already. So, okay, 
So contextual, checking contextuality corresponds to finding such a D, solving this equation, and now the non-contextual fraction can be computed by a linear programming that's a linear program that's sort of based on this, which is now we're trying to find the vector C, so some sort of this will be our sub probability, and it's trying to maximize its weight, we're trying to ma maximize um, the sum of the, the values of, the, uh, of every coordinate of C. And instead of requiring equality there, we just require um, that it's less than or equal to. Okay, so that's it's still consistent with the model. And okay, so you can, uh, so this is the way to compute the, uh, the non contextual fraction. Um, and so the, the maximal value you get is the non contextual fraction. Um, okay, so now about violation of flow inequality. So backtrack a bit. And we again think about this uh, scenario X and O, and we're, we're, we're going to talk about the general forms of inequalities that we can impose on, on such a scenario. So an inequality uh, will be determined by two things. One is a set of coefficients, one for each cell of the probability table, so one, one for each local assignment, and a bound. And in particular, given a model E, <coughs> the inequality will read like that. So this VAE, which is defined as just summing over, so putting the coefficient next to the probability of uh, seeing the joint outcome S whenever we do the measurements, the measurements in, a, in a measurement context C. Right? So, this is, so and, uh, the inequality just reads as this value should be less than or equal to a certain bound. And this inequality, oh, so just one, one, one little comment, this R can be always taken to be non-negative, in fact we can take it to be zero because we can just transform the inequality by the uh, equivalent inequalities with this property. Uh, so such an inequality we call the Bell inequality whenever it's satisfied by every non-contextual model. Okay, so if, if such an inequality is, is uh, um, satisfied by every non-contextual model, which in, in terms of locality corresponds to every local model, uh, then it's called the Bell inequality. And in particular, if it's, if it's saturated by some non-contextual model, we, we say that it's a tight value inequality. Okay, uh, so as we said, the value inequality sort of establishes a bound of the value of this V alpha E amongst all the, the non-contextual models. But if you think of general low signaling models, uh, this value might, be, might go above the inequality. So if you think of the usual Bell inequality, the bound would be three, and the uh, but uh, no signal can, can violate it up to four. Or if you think of the CHSH inequality, which is slightly different, the bound is two, but no signal models can go up to four. Uh, so for a general no signal model, anyway, you can calculate what's the uh, the limiting quantity, and it's just given by this expression. So it's not really very much. So the, the idea is that this is sort of the maximum uh, violation that you can achieve by so it makes sense when you talk about how much, by how much does an empirical model violate the inequality. If we want to find a, a, a number between 0 and 1, then we should normalize it. So we should check so what's the difference between the actual value that's achieved and the bound. But then we should normalize it by the maximal possible violation. So the idea is that this, this will allow us to compare violations of different Bell inequalities implicitly across different scenarios. So, so this is the result that we have connecting the contextual fraction and the, and the violation of these general Bell inequalities. So if you have an empirical model, then first, the normalized violation that this empirical model achieves of any Bell inequality for that scenario is at most a contextual fraction. Moreover, this bound is actually attained, so there exists one Bell inequality whose normalized, or there exists a Bell inequality whose normalized violation by the empirical model is exactly its contextual fraction. So uh, you can see that, so basically the contextual, you, you can say that the contextual fraction is essentially the maximal violation is actually achieved of any Bell inequality. And then moreover, this Bell inequality is tied at, at the non-contextual part of the model, this E and C. So whenever you can write this E as um, a convex combination of the non-contextual and the strong contextual model, this Bell inequality will be tied for uh, at its uh, at its model. And I, I, I have the uh, in 
quotes because it's not this, this decomposition is not necessarily unique. So there might be more than one model, even though they all achieve uh, the same bound. And all of them would be so the, the value quote would be tight for all of them. Uh, okay, so 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 how do we calculate this? Uh, particular value inequality. So if you go back to the linear programming we had before, to quantify contextuality, and in particular, we, so we were, uh, whenever we could find this thing, then uh, if x uh, star is, a, is an optimal solution for the linear program, then, then we have this decomposition of the, uh, the model E in terms of the non-contextual part and the strong contextual part with uh, the weight of this. So if this is if this is our um, model, you can think so. This is the, the non-contextual polytope within the, the no signaling polytope. Uh, then what this corresponds to is if you if you, if you have some sort of line going through, if you have the line that goes through this this point and and our model, then the distance between then the lambda corresponds to the ratio between the distance. Uh, so the ratio of the distance between the model and non-contextual polytope and on a denominator you have the, the whole distance between this and the non-contextual polytope. So it's sort of the, how, how big is this distance in comparison to how, how big it can be. To, so, so how do we find the, uh, this value inequality? So we consider the dual uh, linear program, so this is just, a, this linear program is just the dual of that one. But now we need to do a little transformation, so we just take a to be one minus number of contexts times is y, and then so equivalently you can rewrite this dual linear program uh, as the following linear program. So we try to find an a, so this will be the vector of coefficients of the Bell inequality that maximizes um, so maximizes the uh, this is the value that, that is attained on the left hand side of the Bell inequality and is subject to the so the, the first thing we have here just means that this is the Bell inequality. It just means that um, this is a Bell inequality with bound zero. It just means that every non-contextual model will satisfy the Bell inequality with bound zero. And so this this linear program can be used to uh, compute the tight Bell inequality that we were talking about, which corresponds to sort of separating our domain, separates the model from. Okay, so now, how much time do I have? Uh, just over five minutes. So, just at the end, we just, uh, just mentioned that we have uh, implemented these things uh, in a mathematical package, and um, so these are some results of computational explorations with this package that actually appeared in Chain Stevens almost two years ago already. But uh, so this, this package, um, so we can calculate quantum empirical models from any quantum state and any set of compatible measurements. It calculates the incident matrix uh, of any measurement scenario, and then it can use the, the uh, linear program we're talking about to quantify the degree of contextuality, or use the dual linear program to find the Bell inequality, uh, the tight Bell inequality uh, corresponding to it. And so, so just some examples of running these we had. So if you think about a two qubit Bell state, um, this one, five plus, and we think about doing equatorial measurements, so which are equatorial in the box sphere, so they're parameterized by the angle phi 1 and phi 2, and um, are we doing this, so, so we're taking both Alice and Bob to do these this two same measurements. And for example, if you, if you choose 0 and phi over 3, you get, you get the usual Bell CHSH model, uh, which we started with. Um, and in general, if you, we, we can actually plot the value of the non contextual fraction. Uh, so here is phi 1, here is phi 2, so it goes from 0 to phi, and you can, you can see the, uh, the plot of the non contextual fraction. And you, so whenever it achieves a minima, that's the, the maximal possible value of contextuality, because when, when you have minimal non contextual fractions, you have maximal contextual fraction. And the minimums of the plot are achieved in these uh, four different points. Correspond to having basically the 
this table of probabilities with, with p being equal to this value. And so we all achieve the zero sum time for, for the CVT scenario. Uh, so the second, uh, second example is, is the, if you think about it, the, the n by die change that states, so for n bigger equal to uh, for, for n larger than 2, like uh, strictly larger than 2, so you, you find a change that state in this way. And uh, so, for example, for uh, Mervin has considered taking poly X and poly Y measurements, and you can find a logical proof of non locality that has been mentioned in several talks before. Uh, but if now we just consider all the equatorial measurements on a block sphere, and we do a similar uh, plot. And here we have for GHZ3 and for GHZ4, and again, we can find the minima of these plots, which are the maximal uh, contextuality for these particular scenarios. They're found, so for three, they're found at these um, points. And so the first one corresponds to the poly y and x measurements, so the usual GZ model. But the, uh, with, with the other choices of measurements, we, we get an identical model, just not to relay things. And we can still do the, the familiar moment parity arguments with that. And uh, at n equals 4, we have uh, these four things. And in general, we can actually, so by, by, by this computational exploration, we can see that uh, there's a pattern here and in fact it does hold that for general n uh, this is, this is the, uh, the points at which you can find you can find a strong contextual model so one with, with a contextual fraction equal to one okay and, uh, so this is my final slide which I'll go through quickly uh, it's about some further directions some of which we've been uh, already a bit. So the first one has to do with negative probabilities. So if you remember how we came about, so the contextual fraction we had, so we had this requirement that there would be a global probability distribution in order for something to be non-contextual. And we said, well, can we find a sub uh, a sub distribution, probability sub distribution that would uh, that would still be consistent with the model, but not recover the whole model. But instead of that, we could ask for quasi probability distribution, so a probability distribution that allows for uh, negative values as well. And uh, so ask for a, a negative probability distribution that actually recovers the whole of the model. So when restricted to each context, it's actually a normal probability distribution and recovers the, the empirical probabilities you have. Uh, but now we, it's always possible to find such a, such a negative probability distribution. So we, we have to look for one with minimal weight. And this, this value, so this epsilon would be the value, the uh, <coughs> weight of the negative part of this distribution. So this could provide an alternative measure of contextuality. And uh, instead of corresponding to this convex decomposition between a non-contextual and a strong contextual model, what it actually corresponds to is to some, some sort of affine decomposition of two non-contextual models. So it's, you have two non-contextual models, you have a line through them, and then you go past one of them very slightly. As, 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 as least as possible. And that's what the, the edge sort of captures. And uh, so you can, you can so the, the corresponding inequality you get from the, 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 the dual leader programming is something like this, so you have some absolute value in there. And in fact, when you have a cyclic measurement scenario, so for the, 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 the Specker's triangle or the usual 2 to 2 belt scenario started with, which is the cycle before, uh, the, the 5 cycle, which is kind of the, the, the Ashko. Model. For those uh, scenarios, uh, we do have uh, that two, so that the, the measure of contextuality in terms of these negative probabilities actually does correspond to the one, um, to the contextual fractions. So a, the, the, they, 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 they vary just by a, a constant factor. Uh, okay, so I yeah, should stop. So the, the other two things I was mentioning is signaling models. So if you have empirical data that may not satisfy no signaling, because we use a similar idea and uh, define a signaling fraction. And then, indeed, we, I mean, this is quite a rough idea that we, we tried with some real data from the delta NIST experiments. And this is the stuff, this is what we got. So the delta is, as you know, very little, very few um, actual experimental runs. Uh, so it's not very good, but it almost, sort of, the strong potential part almost achieves the uh, serial sum down. But anyway, so this, this, this idea of taking the no-signing fraction is not very 
well developed yet. So in particular, do we take first an assuming fraction and then a non-contextual fraction, or do we go the other way around? And also, if you have to do these two things in a row, we have to choose a particular witness, and these things are not unique. So it's not a, so it still needs some more work to be done. And uh, also connections with this other contextuality by default approach. So we've been thinking about that. And finally, so the idea is that. to go towards the resource theory for, for contextuality. And to try to find which sort of properties a good measure should satisfy. It. And in particular, the, the, the some operations that should not, there should be contextuality non-increasing. These are a few examples of, of those. So if, if you have a signaling distribution, that's, that's what I mean. Oh, so it's yeah. so, the, so the idea here is to be, so if, if you start from a signaling, if you have uh, a signaling okay. distribution, can you analyze them and, 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 okay, and okay, make I any sort of, uh, from yeah, so I, 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 I went a little, a little too okay. fast. Uh, but the idea, I mean, similarly, this, this other approach by uh, Zaparov and all, for the contextual by default, sort of deals with uh, uh, sort of signaling models or uh, empirical data that are, that are signaling. So they, they've been considering that, but in, in general, I mean, Empirical data will sometimes actually have signal. So, okay. so, so the idea is, can we say anything meaningful still about the existence of actual contextuality? Yeah. But um, this, is, this is still sort of very early work. This, this part of it. Okay. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the direction of resource theories, is yep. your measure you check whether it's like a monotone or anything? Uh, so the measure, like I assume, like local operations, like relabeling inputs yeah, and outputs. Yeah, so that's the uh, so that's the, the operation that was, I was mentioning here. So relabelings, uh, restriction, uh, coarse graining outcome ah, values, right. okay, so uh, tensoring, well, convex combinations. So you've proven, proven you've proven. Uh, yeah, so all, all for ah, all of those, that's cool. true. So convex combinations. Uh, so this, this last one is the one we're not quite sure how to, uh, how to ah, describe because well. we need some sort of causal structure. To it's related to the temporal ordering issue. That Yes, actually. Um, I see there are several other questions, but we are also running a little bit behind. Um, maybe one more very quick question. I'm not sure who was. Who's hand was first? Maybe. Uh, how can uh, real data be seen? <laughs> okay, good. Okay, yeah. Sorry. How can real data be seen? Well, uh, the actual. Uh, how can it not be? Is more the question. <laughs> if you actually do an experiment, you'll always find signaling in your in your in, in the data. You use. So yeah. uh, no, I mean it's just it's just a question of uh, if you if you if you actually if I, if I give you a fair coin and you toss it uh, ten times, it's not uh, with a hundred percent probability that you'll have five heads and five tails, right? So that's, that's yeah. one. So it's not necessarily an experimental data, uh, an experimental error. There could also be an experimental error, uh, but it's not necessarily just from experimental error. And also. So the other motivation that uh, uh, people like Zafarov had were, was from stuff that's not uh, from quantum mechanics. So their motivation was coming from uh, psychology experiments and other things where, where there might actually be signal leak in this thing. I'm going to ask a bit, uh, further questions.